To Bible students, the current unfolding of scenes that take place all around us present conclusive evidence of an approaching great catastrophe, right? Now, I'm not a calamity howler this morning. I'm going to read some things from the Bible, though, that are important to our well-being in the now and in the not yet. Human genius and statesmanship seem important and impotent and helpless to stem the tide of violence that we find throughout the world and the anger and the unrest. And nature seems even to be running out of its course with more and more frequency. We are indeed living in a most solemn period of the Earth's history. The destiny of a teeming multitudes on the planet uh, is about to be decided, for the hour of his judgment has come. A message goes forth to the world just before Jesus comes. The hour of God's judgment has come. And the verdict of that judgment is found in Revelation chapter 22. I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22, verse 11, the verdict of the judgment that takes place just before Jesus comes. Revelation 22, verse 11. Give you time to find it. That's an easy book to find, isn't it? It's a little better than Obadiah, right? Verse 11 says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, what does it say next? I come quickly. Right after the verdict of the judgment. This is one of the great texts to help us understand that there is a judgment just before Jesus comes. Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. So our future well-being depends upon the course we pursue. All this gives an urgency to the message of the Bible. Events of vital importance are taking place all around us. I read someplace this little statement. It says, before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. It's from a little book. Great Controversy, 464. As we approach the final conflict, it becomes more and more essential to talk about some of these things. And what place we will occupy in this grand and awful time in which we're living. I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Romans, the 13th chapter. Romans chapter 13. Romans 13. I want to read verses 11, 12, and 14. Romans 13, 11, 12, and 14. It's good to hear the pages of the Bible rustling. Verse 11. It says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when, when we believed. Paul wrote this about the year 63 or 4 AD. What do you think? We're living 2,000 years beyond that now, aren't we? He says, high time, verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And verse 14. But you, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Bible students should know the time. Why? Because the Bible provides the way. It marks, it has the way marks. And the faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. You know, Christian religion is the only faith religion in all the world. And where does faith come? It comes from the Word of God, right? So in the faith cometh by hearing. The faith to lay hold on these words to be inspired to a new way of life, a new way of thinking before the final events unfold. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We need to think like he thinks, right? This is his word. This is how he thinks. 
We have it right before us all the time, don't we? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. I won't read those. 1 Thessalonians 5, that was our scripture reading today. But it talks about being ready, right? Not getting ready. Jesus didn't say to get ready. He said, be ready for my coming. By the way, the whole chapter, 1 Thessalonians 5, is about how to be ready for Jesus to come. I would, I would recommend that for a Sabbath afternoon read. 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. Now, the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians talks about the second coming. Uh, he comes in the clouds, and every eye will see him uh, in Revelation 1-7. That's a great event that's just ahead of us. But 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us how we be ready. And how well do we know the time that we're living in? By the way, what day is he talking about? When he, says, when he talks about this. It is none other than the day which has been the day that God's true followers throughout the centuries have had in focus. The day of the blessed hope when Jesus returns. It's almost as though the whole Christian world throughout the centuries, those who are true followers of Jesus, have looked, stood on tiptoe waiting for Jesus to come. And here we are living in the times that we, that we should know what time it is. The day which is the focus of Daniel, the focus of Revelation, and all through the New Testament, over 200 times, the second coming of Jesus is mentioned, mingled among all those different promises that are in those chapters, many chapters. Jesus said of it, watch and pray. It's the day toward which all creation moves. It's the day that determines what we are. You know, we just read that text, that he that is unjust be unjust still, that he that is righteous, let him, let him be righteous still. When the final day comes, it's a revelation of what we are, who we are. The day that determines whether we've built on sand or on a solid rock. Many will say, Jesus said in that day, that day, Lord, Lord, we have done many wonderful things, but somehow the, the mark was missed and they weren't ready. The day that determines whether we build on sand or solid rock. Hebrews 10, verse 25. I'd like to invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. 25, I'm sorry. Hebrews 10, verse 25. <clears throat> Hebrews 10, verse 25. It says... <clears throat> Not forsaking the assemblings of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see what? The day approaching. We're talking about that day today. This is a real challenge. This was a real challenge, this verse, for the Christians who lived in the first century. Not forsaking the assembling of themselves together. Why was it a challenge for them? Because they often had to worship under circumstances that um, had to do with tyranny and persecution. Many times they couldn't, couldn't worship openly. The apostles were thrown into prison again and again. And uh, the apostle Paul went to cities and there was a lot of tyranny going on. They met in houses, sometimes in secret. The idea of assembly also challenges us. Living in the first cent 21st century America, while we, while we still have full religious liberty. Aren't you glad for that? So we of all people who have this liberty should be coming together every time we get a chance, right? Wherever the word of God is opened, we have the blessed privilege of knowing Jesus better. What an idea. And which is worse? I might ask this question. Now, which would you think would be worse? Being too busy and too tired or religious persecution, <laughs> okay? One of these days we're gonna have both, right? We might be tired too, but uh, which do you think is worse? Now, I think it's much worse to be under religious persecution, right? But you know what? Persecution somehow makes people more genuine. It makes them more, more uh, fervent for the Lord. And so maybe this is one of the reasons why we might be a little tired and a little weary sometimes. Too busy, too tired? 
That's the sleep of the virgins. Jesus told a, a parable about ten virgins. And uh, there is a passage that we just read. It talks about primitive godliness. What would that look like? Primitive godliness. When we think of prim primitive godliness, you know, I kind of have in my mind's eye the, the first century church. Notice what it was like. Acts, the second chapter. Acts, chapter 2. Acts, the second chapter. Acts 2, 45, 46, 47. We might start with verse 42. Acts, chapter 2, verse 42. This comes right after the, the sermon by Peter on the day of Pentecost. There was a lot of activity going on that day. 3,000 people were baptized in one day in that little city of Jerusalem. I have no idea how they facilitated that. Sometimes when we have two or three baptisms, while we have a lot of, a lot of activity going on, 3,000 of them baptized in one day. And these people, when they met Jesus through the preaching of Peter on the day of Pentecost, notice what they did, verse 42. They continued steadfastly in what? The apostles' doctrine, okay? And fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Verse 45. And sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. I think we're going to come to that again. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Praising God, and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church, what does it say next? Daily, people were added to the church, such as should be saved. I believe the final generation church will look like the first century church. Notice a passage in Malachi chapter 3. It kind of bears on this idea of getting together whenever we can to hear the word of God read. Malachi chapter 3. By the way, this is the judgment hour passage starts out that way in chapter 3. And uh, these verses, these precious verses, in, uh, let's look at 16 and 17. It says, And they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard, heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and thought upon his name. Now, if you read the first part of this chapter, it's about the judgment, the judgment hour in which we live. And now notice verse 17, And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serves him. This is uh, a snapshot of the, of, the, of the church in the final generation, actually totally dependent upon the Lord. And notice again that phrase in Hebrews chapter 10, so much the more as they see the day approaching. That's just packed with meaning. As we literally see the day approaching. As Adventists, that day will soon occupy all of our living thoughts. I'd like to review with you a text in Acts, the 17th chapter, I just want to read the first, prep, the first phrase in that verse. Acts 17, verse 3. You know, I have the wrong verse here. <laughs> somehow I, I got it wrong okay let's move on and why do we come, come, to study, come together for, study and bi for Bible study and prayer there are some reasons that come to my mind why we come together you know one of the reasons we come together is for information right the Bible says my people are destroyed for lack of what? Knowledge. knowledge. That's Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. 
Verse, and the second reason that we could think of is preparation. Information, and then what follows? Preparation. You know, somehow there needs to be a connect between information that goes in here into the forehead and the preparation that goes, goes on here as well. That takes place in the forehead as we consider Bible truth and meditate upon it. And then should come from the information, stream from the information, regeneration and restoration. That's what God's desire for us is. The virgins all had lamps. What, is the, what were the lamps that the virgins had in Matthew 25? It was the word of God, right? Thy word is a what? Lamp unto my feet and a light unto thy path. All the virgins had lamps. How many of you have a Bible? <laughs> Some of you might have five or eight Bibles, right? I have about 25 of them at home. Thy word is the lamp unto my feet. The virgins all had Bibles. The five wise virgins were allowing the Holy Spirit to bring that truth into their hearts and to the inner sanctuary of their souls. Faith results in preparation. The golden oil, the precious oil, that's what was lacking with the five foolish virgins. Let us allow the Holy Spirit, let's pray for the Holy Spirit to come into our lives every day so that the truth, so that we can settle into the truth so that we can't be moved, to, moved from it when the day of test comes. This was a difference between the ten virgins, five wise and five foolish. The five foolish ones were short of the golden oil. That parable, by the way, comes on the heels of Matthew 24, Christ's own prophecy about what it would be like in the days just before Jesus comes. The disciples asked him a question. They said, Lord, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? And so he gives them what we have in Matthew 24. Also find it in Mark, the 13th chapter, and Luke, the 21st chapter. A repeat, where he answers the disciples' questions about the signs of his coming in the end of the world. The future has been open to us. I want to say this, that I believe that the future has been open to us as plainly as it was to the disciples in the day that Jesus talked to them that way. The events connected with the close of human probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented to us, especially throughout the New Testament, but the whole Bible is about that. You know, if the people of the Old Testament had been studying the great prophecies of the Old Testament and had been studying the word and to the law and to the testimony, if it had been become a part of them, they probably wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. That's what Matthew 24 and 25 are all about, and Daniel and Revelation also. We have the information from the Lord himself so we can follow the footsteps of our heavenly Lord. I believe there will be a series of events that will occur in the near future which will reveal to us that God is the master of the situation, that he's in charge. How many of you believe that God is in charge of the earth today? It doesn't matter who's in the White House, right? It doesn't matter about that. God is in charge. He sets up kings and he takes down kings. And in the end time, we can have that, that simple confidence that God is in charge. I also believe these things will, will not be no noticed by us, these indications that God's in charge, that they will not be noticed by us unless we give ourselves to Jesus every day. Give yourself to God in the morning. Make that your very first work. And pray that the Holy Spirit will come into your life and give you understanding and, and, um, and guidance for that day. What time is it anyway? Let's take a look at a text over in Ezekiel, Old Testament. The Jews were down there in Babylon. They had been captives there for a number of years already. Ezekiel, the 16th chapter, 12th chapter, I'm sorry. Ezekiel chapter 12. <clears throat> And 21 and 22. You know, Ezekiel and Daniel were both in Babylon at this time in the history of the world. Daniel was where? In the court of the king, right? Indeed, Daniel was a prime minister of a world empire. 
He's the only one I know of or ever heard of that was the prime minister of two world empires because Medo-Persia followed. And he became the prime minister of Medo-Persia as well. God certainly favored him greatly. He was taken captive in the first captivity of Babylon. When Babylon, when the armies of Babylon came down to Jerusalem, he was one of the first captives. Ezekiel was taken about 10 years later uh, in the second captivity. There were three captivities. So Ezekiel, and where's Ezekiel at this time? He's out there with the people who are complaining and murmuring, just like they did with Moses out in the wilderness. It was a terrible time for Ezekiel. He was God's prophet. God's prophet was having a hard time. Can you imagine that? And uh, they come to him with all their troubles. And um, the Lord would speak to Ezekiel. And Ezekiel would carry the message back to the people. So Ezekiel chapter 12, 21. Here's what it says. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, what is that proverb that you have in the land of Israel? saying that the days are, are prolonged and every vision faileth. Some of those people were saying the visions are, not, are worthless. They all fail. They were complaining to Ezekiel. Ezekiel was telling the word of God. He'd gotten the visions. And uh, these capped, rebellious people down there in Babylon, they made God's prophecies a proverb. Notice verse 23. Tell them, therefore... Thus saith the Lord, I will make this proverb to cease, and there shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel, but say to them, the days are at hand, and the effect of the vision, the days are at hand. So uh, perhaps they even laughed about it. The visions of Ezekiel, they're just a proverb. They're just a joke, okay? They were in Babylon because they rejected the prophecies of Jeremiah. That's why they were there. The prophecy, the prophet that just preceded Ezekiel. And Ezekiel was documenting for them faithfully the messages from God about their mistakes and their folly in even being down there. If they had heeded Jeremiah, turned to God, it would have been like, like when Jonah went to Nineveh. There would have been a great turning to God, right? A revival among them. So I ask you this morning, what time is it? God says to Ezekiel, tell the church it's almost a new day. Prophesy, prophecy is not merely a proverb. He said, go tell them that. Prophecy is not just a proverb or a, or a, or a joke. So what about the prophecies? Nearly all of our evangelistic meetings where we're seeking to tell people about the, the times that we're living in, Nearly all of our evangelistic meetings start with Daniel chapter 2. Now, you're all familiar with Daniel chapter 2, aren't you? It's the, it's the vision that, that Daniel, that actually Nebuchadnezzar had, and Daniel repeated to the, to, the, to the king of a metal man made of gold and silver and brass and iron and feet of iron and clay. The successive kingdoms from Daniel's time down to the time when a rock is cut out of the mountain and the rock becomes a mountain and fills the whole earth, the kingdom of God restored. So <clears throat> why do you think that almost all the meetings start with that prophecy? <laughs> Daniel 2 is a simple, straightforward prophecy and convinces all who, heal, who will hear that our day has come. The empires of the Bible have come one after another, Mab Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, Rome, the breakup of the Roman Empire, the feet and toes of the image. And the next thing that happens is the coming of Jesus. Where are we today? What time is it? And people who hear this and listen to it and study it and, me and meditate upon it are smitten with the idea of the Lord, we're, we're living in the end time of the world's history. The prophecy says, in the days of these kings, the kings of the ten toes, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. This is a linear prophecy, starting with Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece. And what does linear mean anyway? There's some carpenters here, right? <laughs> I know one right here, Jim. <laughs> what is linear? Linear feet is lumber, right? It passes right on to the length of a piece of board, right? Yeah. This is a linear prophecy. It moves right on to the end when Jesus comes. No in-betweens, it just states it very simply. 
I hope we don't make this a proverb in the Adventist church. We need to take it seriously. In Revelation, there are seven churches. And uh, we're the last one, Laodicea. In Revelation, there are seven seals, and we're approaching the sixth one. Let's look at it a little bit. The sixth seal, Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. I'd like to read uh, verses 12 to 17. Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 to 17. This is the sixth seal. <clears throat> Verse 12 says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. And lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll and is rolled together. And every mountain and every island moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens of the rock and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. And then the next word is four. We're talking about that day today. We're talking about that day today. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? And the next chapter tells who will be able to stand. It answers the question. Interesting things. The seventh is a trip to heaven, the seventh seal. That's when it's all over with. Revelation 10 is a prophecy that strikingly describes the rise of the Advent movement. We're in the days of the voice of the seventh trumpet as he begins to sound. That's where we are today. Let's turn to Revelation 10, verses 6 and 7, where it talks about this. Revelation 10, verses 6 and 7. Verse 6 says, And swore by him that lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that, there, that, are, that therein are, and the earth and the things that are therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Time no longer? But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he had declared to his servants the prophets. These are not just proverbs. These are not folly. These are real, genuine prophecies. And uh, then the, it says here that the mystery of God should be finished. In, Revelation, or in Romans chapter 16, it says the mystery, of, the mystery is the gospel. That's the great mystery that's been hidden. Most of the earth's population still waits to hear the gospel. The mystery finished, it says, in the days of the seventh angel. We're living in those days. When that, come, when that day comes, human invitation from God ceases. Let's read about it in Amos. Amos chapter 8. Uh, if you're a student of Daniel, your Bible will fall open, open to Daniel. Then you have Daniel, Hosea, Jonah, I'm sorry, Joel, then Amos, fourth one from Daniel. Amos chapter 8, 11 and 12. Amos 8, verses 11 and 12. Amos 8, 11 and 12. This is not a proverb, my friends. This is real. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God. That I will send a famine in the land, and a famine, not a famine of bread, nor thirsty for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord. And what does it say next? And shall not find it. A famine for the word of God? 
The time will come when there'll be no more time. No more time to make our, make our peace with God. Picture with me a, a scenario. We're in a great baseball stadium. It's the deciding game of a World Series. The score is even, and it's the ninth inning, okay? The player's up to bat. Two men are on the bases. Two strikes have just been called. Got the picture? Thousands of eager eyes are upon the batter. He lifts his eyes briefly to the bleachers for a moment, then he blinks. He hears the confused roar of myriads of people who are fans. He it is to whom they are shouting. Fate is in his hands. If he ever prays, we believe that he's praying right now, right? This is the crucial moment. This is the last time. When this is done, there is no second chance. The earth is quickly moving to that point in the idea of salvation. I'd like to have you turn with me to 1 Corinthians. And I think we're going to quit on time today. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And verses 9, and then we'll go to verse 11. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 9. It says, For I think that God has set us, set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a, what is the word? A spectacle to the world and to angels and to men. Think of that batter <laughs> on the field on the World Series, the final game. Verse 11. Even to this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things to this day. I write these things, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. And then the appeal comes in verse 21. What will you? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love, in the spirit in, or in, or, and in the spirit of meekness? Paul is making an appeal to the Corinthian church. <clears throat> there was a lot of wasted time in Corinth. In Corinth, there was too much bread, too much idleness, just like in Rome later on, and too much circus. A lot of wasted time in Corinth, a lot of goings on that were not in harmony with their high calling in Jesus. The church was really in trouble. Upon their faith, the souls of others were being influenced. They were a, what, what does the scripture say? A spectacle or a theater. They were, they were the ones that were being watched in that city. The church is a theater a theater to the world and to the angels and to men. That's where we are. The signs of the times are all around us. We too are there, all of us. But thank God Jesus is there as well. No one in the whole universe wants to see the work, wants to see the work finished more than Jesus does. In fact, Jesus is in our boat. You know the, you know the story, don't you? Jesus is in our boat. We're in a terrible situation. And Jesus is in our boat. As the storm blasts and buffets that boat. Not only is the time at, is at hand, but we're really on borrowed time. There is a chapter in Revelation, which we referred to earlier, chapter 10, the rise of the Advent movement. It's all about 1844, a little book open in the angel's hand, which explains the prophecies of Daniel that Daniel had a hard time understanding. In fact, he was deeply troubled about, that, about those passages in Daniel 8 and 9. And uh, how many more 
years are we going to be passively, passively reading Daniel 8.14? <laughs> passively reading it. Is it a proverb? Or is it real? Does it have substance to it? Or is it the word of God? The declaration is made, time shall be no longer. We're living in the ninth inning, the last time. It's time that is borrowed from eternity. We don't belong here anymore. I've come to that conclusion. It's not the will of God that the coming of Christ should so long be delayed and his people remain so many years in this world of sin. I think that's a truism. That's not a great controversy, by the way. In the parable of the ten virgins, the bridegroom tarried. Why do you think the bridegroom tarried? God has his reasons, of course. But there's some hints. I would like to suggest um, from 2 Peter 3, verse 9, that uh, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. That's, that's not why there's a tarrying going on in the ten virgin parable. But it's because he wants everyone who will to have an opportunity to know Jesus in a personal way. That's how much God loves the, the people of this planet. Opportunity to know and, and, and choose saving truth. I suspect that many have not even heard, let alone made a decision. There might be a second reason. That's the first reason. God loves us so much. He's not slack concerning his promise. But a second reason might be that we're not ready. Think that might be a possibility? Uh, the gloom is trying, but the morning is deferred in mercy because if the master should come, so many would be found unready for his coming. God's unwillingness to have people perish has been the reason perhaps for the long delay. Our closing text today is found in Ephesians chapter five. Ephesians chapter 5, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. It's a little book. It's found between Corinthians and Thessalonians. Ephesians chapter 5, I'd like to have you follow along with me. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. Fifteen says, see then that you walk circumspectly. Uh, in my margin of my Bible, it says carefully, wisely, not as fools, but as wise. Verse 16, redeeming the time because the eight days are evil. And let's drop down now to 20, verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things to God and to the, and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verses 25 and 26, husbands, Love your wives. That's a symbol of something. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the what? The church. And gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Jesus once told the disciples in John 15, he says, you are, now you are clean through the word. The word is the greatest cleansing agent that we can have if we can spend some time every day studying the word meditating upon each, each passage as we read it. Because the book is about who? Jesus. Jesus is the great cleanser. Now you're clean through the word. If you want something to wash, wash with, spend some time in the word every day. It says uh, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with washing of water and of the word. In verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy. And what does it say? Without blemish. Without blemish. With all that we understand and with all of God's forbearance, would it still be possible for any of us to miss the marriage supper of the Lamb in the homeland? It could be possible, couldn't it? With all of our understanding, it could be possible for us to miss the Last Supper the great supper in the homeland. Where's the homeland, by the way? 
Jesus said, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. That's the homeland, right? We all have a place there. He said, in my father's house are many rooms, in one translation. Another translation, in my father's house are many mansions. He has a place for you. And uh, the homeland. How many want to give yourself to Jesus in a new way, a new commitment to him this morning? I think this is a marvelous time to do this, to give ourselves to Jesus in a meaningful way. Maybe there are some here who have never done that, giving your hearts to Jesus in a meaningful way. Maybe there's somebody here who would like to look forward to baptism and joining the body of Christ, okay, of whom Jesus is the head. The Bible says he's the head and the church is his body. Some of us are arms, some of us are mouthpieces, some of us do things for Jesus. You know, we all have a part in this wonderful body called the church. So uh, our appeal this morning is an invitation to renew or to make new. Might be that case in some pe- with some people. To renew our commitment to the Lord Jesus, realizing that we're living in a grand and awful time.